Neil, why Bet Midler in church from a distance? Because that Bible passage finishes with that phrase where the women who had followed Jesus their whole time of his ministry stand at a distance and watch him die. And that phrase from a distance, far off, far away, all three are the same in the Greek, comes up several times in Luke's gospel. It's almost like he wants us to see the geographical and the spiritual distance between humanity and God. But it's not God watching us from a distance. It's people being distant from God. There's the centurion in chapter 7. It says, so Jesus went to them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This foreigner, this foreign power, believed in the power of Jesus. And when Jesus was far off, he said, don't, don't bother coming, just say the word and my servant will be healed. I was watching a program on BBC4 this week, I am cultured at times, uh, about the beauty of Japan. And they went to a carpenter where they still build houses as they did in the 16th and 17th century. And he said to this English um, document, documentary maker, um, our saws, wh when we cut the wood, only cut when we pull them towards us. Our planes for the wood only work when they pull them towards us. Our matches, when we light them, only actually properly work when we light them towards us. He said, we're completely different to you in the West because your saws work when you saw away. Your wood planes work when you plane away. Your matches, try it when you get home, work best when you light away. He said, for us in a Japanese culture, we're always thinking about protecting the other. And so we saw towards ourselves. So if there is damage done, it's done to me. If I plane and cut, it's me. If I light the match and it flicks, it's me. Never damaging the other person because we stand against the individualistic society that is so prevalent in the West. Who'd have thought BBC4 can give you a gospel message? The prodigal son in chapter 15 is a long way off. He's sawn away, he's planed away, he's lit a match away and said, stuff it to everyone around me. I don't care what my father thinks in the parable that Jesus told. I don't care what my brother thinks. I don't care what the servants think. I'm going to do what I want with my life. And Jesus tells this story where he ends up in the pig pen. And then we see this verse in the middle of the parable. So he got up and went to his father. This is after he'd come to his senses in the pig pen. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. Do you notice it's why the son's a long way off? I can imagine the father seeing the gate of his son's walk and remembering it from a toddler to a teenager to a young adult and thinking, that is my boy. I've been waiting on the veranda, annoying everyone else because I can't be bothered with the fields and the farming because I want this son who was lost to be found. And when he sees him, he runs towards him and he sweeps him up in his arms and he throws a party for him. While he was at a distance. I went to an Arsenal football match a couple of months ago with my daughter Megan um, and we went out to eat beforehand. She said, oh, we just get a burger, Dad, that's fine. And I know that these burgers, one in three kills outside the ground. So I said, no, let's get something nice. She said, well, I'd love to get some Italian food, some pasta. So we went to a, a large Italian restaurant I know on the way there, loads of seating, and we queued up, and it was just beginning to rain, and there was a group of three in front of us, and a group of three, and then there was Megan and I, and the waiter came out, and he said, oh, I've got a table for two. And you always feel slightly guilty but slightly chuffed, don't you, when you step past the groups of three. Sorry, sorry, but I'm not really sorry, but, you know, I have to say it because I'm English. And we went in, and there's a huge restaurant in there. And he said, please follow me to the basement. I thought, I didn't know there was a basement in this restaurant. I've been here a number of times. And we went down the stairs and went all the way around. And there was a tiny bar there. And then there was seating for 18 people. Now, there wasn't seating for 18 people. They were making money on a match day. And they had crammed us in like sardines. Megan and I walked 
Putin, Meghan walked in first. There were two larger gentlemen sat at a table and Meghan couldn't pull her chair back to get in. So he stood up to let her get in. She got in and then I got in and thought, I need to pull the table back so that Meghan can actually sit down when this larger gentleman goes to sit back down. So I pulled the table back. I'm now right up against the wall. I've got nowhere to go. Meghan's there across from me. It just felt really cramped. And then these two Irish twins came in and sat down on the table near us. That made me feel even more claustrophobic because I'm looking at the same person twice. <laughs> who sound the same. And I thought, I need some distance here. This is far, far too cramped. Someone who didn't want distance in another of parables, Jesus, was the rich man. As Lazarus is at the bosom of Abraham in heaven and he's down in that bad place where nobody wants to go and it says in Hades where he was in torment he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side this isn't how it should work the, the rich guy should be in heaven for many Jewish people if you were doing well financially it meant God was blessing you and God loved you if you were outside with your sores being licked by dogs like the leper Lazarus well, you've done something wrong. There was a warped theology there that we don't believe in because we know bad stuff happens to good people and good stuff happens to bad people, don't we? But this guy ends up far, far away from God. Anna Wafula Strike was a para-Olympian. She was in the Olympics, she got to the top of her game, but her church didn't know what to do with her because of their theology. And they kept her as a child at a distance. And in one interview I heard her in, she said, my disability is not a hindrance to God's grace in my life. My disability is not a hindrance to God's grace in my life. And in chapter 17 of Luke's Gospel, we see people who have been hindered by their disability. Lepers. If you've seen Ben-Hur, you know what they look like. Clothes stripped, sores evident, a bell around their neck like a cow, ringing it when people came close, shouting, unclean, unclean, to keep other people away. And in verse, chapter 17, we read this. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus travelled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. Jesus is often in those shady places, isn't he, where the religious elite, elite don't think he should be, between Galilee and Samaria. Go back to the verse, please, Mark. Thank you. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. I imagine these guys have got used to being with one another, don't you? We're all the same. We're all going the same way. None of us have got much hope in life. And then they see Jesus. They don't run to him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. It's embarrassing when people raise their voices like that, isn't it? Shh, just calm it down a bit. We're English, most of us. And those that aren't have kind of got used to behaving like we're English. So if you keep it just a bit, calm. we know your life's fallen apart. We know you've got nowhere to go and we know you want to raise your voice to the hilltops because you've got nothing and you've seen Jesus and you're hoping that he might turn to you and he might heal you so that you can stop living your life at a distance but you can come close. Luke Powell is an American preacher and he was greeted at an Episcopal church in Atlanta by a man called Claxton who said, get out of here, get out of here. It's the way he greeted everyone when they came into his church. Get out of here. Get out of here. Because he had additional needs. And in his culture and time, people felt he was in the way. And so they were always saying to him, get out of here. Get out of here. And he came to think that that was his name. First name, get out. And his surname, of here. So when people came into the church... He thought he was saying, Neil Durley, Neil Durley. Get out of here. 
get out of here. And I imagine that the tax collector in chapter 18 felt that everyone would say to him, get out of here, get out of here. In the parable where Jesus talks about two men who go to the synagogue to pray. The only of Jesus' parable that is set in a church context. And it says, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Men didn't beat their breast in those days. The women did, and they only did it in the context when somebody had died to mourn. And we see that King David did it once when his son died as a baby. It's absolute place of desperation. Whilst the religious leader, the Pharisee, stands confidently and prays a prayer of truth that he has done all that God has asked him to. And the tax collector, get out of here. Get away from our country that you've betrayed, stealing our money, pumping up the taxes. We won't invite you to our village and town celebrations. Get out of here. He's heard it his whole life since he made that decision to become a tax collector. And who leaves made right with God from the synagogue? In Jesus' parable, not the religious leader, but the get out of here, who'd stood at a distance and beaten his breast. And then Peter in chapter 22 has seen Jesus being taken away by the powers that be. And he follows. Then seizing him, they led Jesus away and took him into the house of the high priest. Peter followed at a distance. And Peter went into the court and said, this is wrong. You must stop. Do not do this. And he took Jesus away and Jesus was saved from the cross. No. He stood around the campfire. And when they heard his Galilean, his Newcastle accent, that strong, thick tone. They said, you, you, you must be with him. You, you've got the same accent as Jesus. No, no, I don't know him. A teenage girl, servant girl comes up to him. You, you must be one of his followers. And he swears at her that he doesn't know her. Have you ever seen an adult swear at a teenager? It's a different dynamic to adult to adult. It's a real ferocity in it and he stood at a distance from Jesus and when Jesus comes out and looked at him and loved him Peter went away and sobbed his heart out one of my spiritual mentors is a guy called Matt Baker he's in charge of football chaplaincy for the Premier League and the Championship and he's also the chaplain for Charlton Athletic Football Club they're a dear sweet club that are never going to amount to anything in their lives and I met him for lunch this week to talk and pray and reflect and he shared with me a story he said there's a cleaner at our club and she had a little closet and he said I always walk around the whole ground and I saw this cleaner at the closet and she looked at me on Monday morning and she said look at this this is what I have to get up to every Monday morning and he looked on the door of her closet and it was a bland boring calendar Every Monday, she said, I look at that picture. It was November, so he thought, I'll buy her a Christmas present. Doesn't buy anything for anyone at the club. He's real tight-fisted. And he bought her a calendar for the next year. Had beautiful scenescapes on it. The sea, the woods, the forest. She was so chuffed with it. And so it became something that he did each year. He would buy her a calendar. And then one year he said, what do you like? And she said, oh, I do love kittens and cats. So he bought her one with kittens and cats on it. And, and then she began to cut out the pictures from the calendar and put them in her little boring, dull closet. And people would come and look and say, which month have we got up? Oh, I like that one. That's added. And she said, did you know what? These were her exact words to him. Some days your calendar is the only thing that stops me having a breakdown. And then she announced to all the staff that her little closet was her sunshine office. Because it was a place of beauty where people literally wanted to come and see which pictures were on the wall next. This woman's life was transformed by one small act of kindness that was repeated, repeated, repeated. And in the reading that we've just watched and listened to, the women stand 
at a distance. It's the women in chapter 23. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. And another woman stands at a distance from her son. Mary, with John, who has been taken away from the cross after seeing Jesus there, and Jesus getting John to agree that this will now be his mother, and she will look after him, and he will look after her. And she, because of the violence that they face, is ripped apart from her son. Like so many that we see in the news today. And she is at a distance as her son sacrifices for her. One of my favourite moments with my oldest son, Noah, was when we were travelling in Spain about nine years ago. We were travelling and camping for five weeks. And it was coming up to Noah's, was it his ninth birthday, eighth birthday, eighth birthday. And we thought, well, we're at this campsite. What do we do to make it special? And we bought him a cake and we got tickets to a football match at the local ground, Sporting Gijon, I called it Gijon, and got into trouble. But that's, we have chicken Gijons, don't we? It's Sporting Gijon. And we went to watch Sporting Gijon versus Real Madrid, the team. And before we left, the campsite that we were on, all the old people that lived around us, and they lived there and they watched us, they were excitedly talking to us about Noah's birthday and, and saying to him, well done. And, and we went and we had a great day and then Joe brought the other kids back to our campsite and Noah and I went to watch the football match. And then we walked back along the seafront and I said to Noah, how good has your birthday been today out of 10? He said, I'll give it 9.5, Dad. It's been a really good birthday. And as we walked into the campsite, we saw that our tent was covered in balloons on strings. It looked like that house from Up, if you've ever seen the film. And I thought, Joe and the kids must have put all these balloons on while we were at the football match. But when we came close to the tent, Jesus said, no, the people in the campsite put the balloons on. And they'd done a birthday party for Noah because they didn't realise how late you'd be back. And they'd done churros with chocolate sauce and hot chocolate for us all to eat and drink together. And they got all the kids from the campsite to come in to make his day really special. But he's missed it. And Noah's little lip began to tremble and I thought this is descending from a 9.5 birthday quite quickly. We need to redeem this. So we went to the powerhouse, the centre of the campsite where some of these ladies were and they got us some churros and some chocolate. And we salvaged the day to a degree. But because we didn't speak the language, we were kept at a distance from the party that had been put on for us that we should have enjoyed. In the Gospels, Jesus goes to every distance to remove the language barrier so that we can enjoy the party that God has got for us. Every distance, whether it's geographical, oh, I live in that area, so I can't come to church. Whether it's financial, I'm not rich enough to put in the offering, so I won't come. National, oh, I don't speak the language. Whatever distance it is, Jesus says, I will remove that barrier. Because God doesn't want to look at you from a distance. Bette Midler, good singer, but you got it wrong. We have a God who wants to come close. And Luke continues in Acts chapter 2 and says, Peter replied to this huge crowd of people in the early church, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. God doesn't just come close. He gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit who dwells within us. I had a nose job about 10 years ago. That woke some of you up. It was a medical one, not because I wanted to look physically perfect, um, and I went in for the operation and I didn't know until afterwards that they always put the first person who's got the severest operation to go in first and I'm in bed one and they wheeled me in and they said would you mind if this student doctor watches the operation and I said no it's fine if she stays that's absolutely fine 
Afterwards, I saw her. She came round to the beds, and I said, oh, what was the operation like? She said, I felt sick after five minutes and had to leave. I thought I was going to faint. She said, they had a mallet and a hammer, and they were just nailing the bone in your nose. And they put these plugs up my nose. And I was sat there for about six hours with these plugs up my nose. And then this tiny nurse came out and she said, Now, my love, this is going to feel so painful. It's going to feel like I'm pulling the world out of your nose. I think I don't really need this preamble, to be honest. Now, you can tell me to stop at any moment, but that would just make it more painful. It's better if I do it like a magician, you know, with the handkerchiefs, where they just keep pulling them out. Uh, whoa. It did feel painful, and she was brilliant. I was picked up, taken home, and I was told, you cannot blow your nose for at least two weeks. You've got to let it scab over, and anything that's in there is going to be in there. Have you ever not blown your nose for two weeks? I challenge you to try and do it. It was vile temptation to just do a little no two weeks in our passage Jesus breathes his last after he called out in a large loud voice father into your hands I commit my spirit the nostrils of the creator of the universe breathes out everything that was within him so that all those that are distant can come to him. My mum shared a story with me this week, which I wish she'd shared with me when my dad was alive. Not that I'm telling her off, but I'd encourage you to share these good stories with your kids. I'm not telling you off, honestly, mum, if you're here. Are you here today? Oh, you are there. Okay. You know you're naughty in a lot of ways but I'm not telling you for that uh, when we were kids we used to go to Hastings on holiday quite often and there's a row of shops down there and one of them is a toy shop where you can buy hard plastic animal toys and I would always go there with my pocket money and buy one of those and one year we were down there and money was really tight for us as a family it was fortunate that we could go away on holiday and I got my little bit of pocket money in my pocket and it was only enough to buy one of the small animals and I wanted to buy the big plastic gorilla probably because it looked like my dad but I didn't have the money for it and so dad and I went into the shop and mum and Amanda waited outside and I came out clutching the big black gorilla and my mum looked at my dad and said Rog what have you done he's not got the pocket money for that and he said oh, I gave him a bit extra and I'll just have chips tonight when we have fish and chips and my mum looked at my dad and said I'll just have chips as well then. And I don't smell salt, vinegar, and fish batter in that story. I smell grace in the image of a God who says, I'm going to give you what you need at expense to myself because that's the kind of God I am. And I don't want anyone tax collector, leper, centurion, woman, to be kept at a distance. I want all to come close because of what Jesus has done on a cross. Let's pray together. Let's pray. Some of us here today, I imagine, feel distant from God because of dumb decisions that we've made, sin. And Jesus says, that does not need to keep you at a distance. Say sorry and come home. Some of us feel distant because we're just worn down. We are tired. And the basic things we usually do to remind us that God loves us, we're just not getting round to. And so we feel distant. And Jesus says, come home.
And some of us are distant because we're angry with God. Because we feel that God has let us down, that God has failed us. And God would love us to get honest with him. And Jesus says, come home. Sit at the table with me, as it were, and tell me what you really feel. Jesus, we thank you that though we may stand at a distance from you at times, and in the Gospel of Luke, people clearly did, you are the Saviour that comes close to us. And we thank you. Amen.